I want you to imagine for a second a theoretical country, a country that has almost no natural resources, certainly no coal, oil, or natural gas. About a quarter of the country is either mountains, lakes, or rivers, and is categorized as unproductive for agricultural purposes. It's landlocked, so forget about a navy or shipping prowess. And as far as military is concerned, they haven't taken part in an armed conflict in over 500 years, so you really don't need to worry about them pillaging or plundering their neighbors. And it's tiny. In fact, it's so small it could fit inside of the United States 238 times. Doesn't sound like the recipe for riches and wealth, right? Well, you'd be wrong, because I'm not talking about a theoretical country. I'm talking about Switzerland. You see, Switzerland proves that under the right conditions, any country has the capacity to prosper, and prosper big. Just 150 years ago, it was an agrarian society, and its economic development was that like of Italy, Spain, or Portugal. But today, the average wealth per adult is over a whopping $685,000, and roughly one adult in every six owns assets worth more than one million US dollars. So how exactly did Switzerland get so filthy rich? Well, let's take a look. Hi everyone, today I'm bringing you this video from the Meganhorn in Lake Lucerne, Switzerland. And Switzerland is such a fascinating country because it's one where specifically words like upheaval and chaos aren't typically set alongside with it. Citizens and businesses around the world trust Switzerland and its institutions. Laws are clear, stable, and properly enforced. And this is in part due to the fact that Switzerland has a very rigid legal system. It's very difficult for a government to implement radical reforms without having massive political support or asking the people to approve those reforms in a series of referendum. And consequently, the political system doesn't seem to change on a whim every four years, giving its citizens political whiplash. So things like the country's taxation systems also don't tend to change just simply whenever politicians feel like it, which also means that taxes don't seem to change as frequently and rise as quickly, which always pushes taxes higher in the long run. And all of this together means that Switzerland attracts a lot of capital. Countries are not afraid to invest in Switzerland, and this creates jobs. But it's actually even more interesting than that, because when you look at the globe as a whole, there are very few countries that are more decentralized than Switzerland. Switzerland is a federation of 26 cantons, and each canton has significant fiscal powers and fiscal autonomy, as they're entitled to manage nearly 25% of their total fiscal income social insurance included. Only Canada and the United States have similarly high ratios for their own provinces or states. Although praised as a model of federalism, Germany's Bundesländer are only allowed freedom of choice in about 0.7% of their fiscal revenues. Plus, the individual cantons are free to make their own fiscal policies, largely making their own decisions on how to tax corporations and individual income taxes alike. Switzerland thus favors a fiscal competition system between federal entities, which in each canton decides by itself what role the tax system should play in the canton's overall economic attractiveness. This institutional competition limits the state's fiscal appetite and creates incentives for a sound allocation of public spending. It also allows comparison and benchmarking between the cantons, encouraging the spread of the most efficient regional solutions. In short, the individual cantons actually compete against one another to make their region more attractive to both businesses and consumers alike. Ihre Hand, bitte. While the secrecy and luxury of Switzerland's banks have brought it international notoriety, the financial industry only actually accounts for 12% of GDP and 6% of employment. And that includes the banking sector, the asset management industry, and the insurance sector. Switzerland is so much more than just finance. In fact, it's home to many high value industries. Switzerland was the first country in continental Europe to industrialize. 
sometime around the Napoleonic Wars. And this head start meant that their textile industry in particular was actually able to compete with England. They also were very technically skilled by doing pre-industrial work such as watches or embroidery. In addition, Swiss people were also likely to be highly educated at a time when the population en masse was not. In the 1700s, most Swiss people knew how to read and write due to the high percentage of Protestants. You needed to be able to read the Bible. And this greatly helped industrialization. So fast forward to today, and it isn't actually probably so surprising that Switzerland is home to some of the world's leading largest global companies, such as Nestle, Roche, UBS, Credit Suisse, Swiss Re, Zurich Insurance, or ABB. But you know, even though Switzerland is home to many international, large global companies, it's interesting to note that 99% of all companies in Switzerland are small and medium-sized. But yeah, of course, for those who love gold, Switzerland also refines about 70% of all global production. And Swiss luxury is a springboard for their image. It's a precious communication tool when competing at an international stage. You know, although the Swiss economy is definitely correlated with the image of luxury, I still find that there exists a lot of ignorance about the Swiss economy. It is often said that Switzerland is rich only because it was involved in money laundering activities and kept the gold of many people after World War II, which quite frankly is obviously absurd. I mean, don't get me wrong, Switzerland was largely untouched during World War II, which definitely gave it a leg up. And Germany sold gold to the Swiss in order to get Swiss currency to make transactions on enemy territories. And Swiss banks bought that gold, well aware that it had been stolen from conquered territories and exploited persons. But to be quite honest with you, to chum up Switzerland's success today to the shady business dealings of 80 years ago doesn't accurately paint a good picture of what their economy is like today. In particular, it doesn't focus on just how fantastic Switzerland's sound public finances are. Historically speaking, the elite and powerful people of Switzerland have almost always been liberal conservative. They came from the industrial sector as well as the financial sector. In order to avoid the agricultural sector making an alliance with the proletariat, they kept helping them through selective protectionism and forged a strong right-wing alliance which is why there was never actually a strong left movement like in the rest of Europe. But this liberal position meant that they tended to keep the state as weak as possible. And again, this is illustrated in the decentralization that I talked about earlier in the 26 individual cantons. At the national level, Switzerland has a history of only doing the absolutely necessary interventions. And in nearly every crisis and international conflict, the liberals and conservatives kept the country as anti-Kinesian as possible. As a result, the politicians here in Switzerland have a much harder time just simply promising free stuff to their citizens in order to get elected. And the Swiss people tend to consider the consequences of the government's actions on the future of the economy. Thanks to this, Switzerland is in an enviable position. Robust public finances go hand in hand with economic stability. The little public debt it has can actually be financed with internal savings, as Switzerland also enjoys large trade surpluses. Another advantage of having such a strong macroeconomic position is its currency, the Swiss franc, which happens to be one of the strongest in the world. Over the past couple of decades, the Swiss franc has appreciated against all the world's major currencies. It has not only appreciated significantly against the euro in the past 20 years or so, but also against the US dollar and the British pound. It means that Switzerland can export its products at higher prices, import products more cheaply, and allows its citizens and companies to invest more easily outside the country. And lest we not forget, safe haven currencies like the Swiss franc do extraordinarily well during times of global crises like what we're experiencing today. And since Switzerland's economic policy is mainly driven by the need to maintain its safe haven status for Swiss franc denominated wealth, whenever the Swiss National Bank finds itself in a situation where it has to choose between combating inflation with either wage growth or Swiss franc appreciation, it will almost certainly choose the latter. You know, it's interesting. Although Switzerland is not technically a tax haven, it does have a much more attractive taxation structure than many Western democracies. In fact, while most countries have actually increased their tax burden, Switzerland on the whole has not. The main VAT rate in Switzerland has hardly changed over time, and today it stands at just 8.1%, which is actually quite low within the European context. Until 1968, VAT in Germany was 10%. Today, it's 19 
And until 1992, the general VAT rate in Spain was 12%. And today, it's 21%. And the same thing can actually be said about income taxes. Swiss personal income tax rates, which depend on the canton one lives in, are significantly lower, with the average corporation pays just between 12 and 22% of its profits in taxes, again, depending on the canton in which they are domiciled. And the property transfer tax for the purchase of a home is between 1 and 3%. And for a bit of personal reference here, guys, when we purchased our home in Baden-Württemberg in Germany, we paid 5% in real estate transfer tax, which is high compared to Switzerland, but maybe I should be counting my blessings because in some states it's as high as 6.5% in Germany. Inheritance taxes, on the other hand, are highly complex and depend again on the canton and the relationship between the deceased and their heir. However, the average effective rate in 2019 stood at just 1.4% of the capital inherited, which again is comparatively low. World-class infrastructure allows the Swiss economy to boost trade, tourism, and mobility. And Switzerland is known for its efficient trains, which almost always run on time and at comparatively competitive prices. For those of you who have had the pleasure of traveling on them, you know what I'm talking about. But it's not just trains. Switzerland also boasts a blockbuster road network. In fact, Sean Connery drove the infamous Furka Pass as James Bond in his Aspen DB5. And if this weren't enough, Switzerland is also a leader in air travel, with one of the highest ratios between passengers and number of inhabitants in the world. And couple all of this with its Central European location, it's quite frankly just easier for both individuals and companies to do business here in Switzerland. And all of that has positive effects for its society as a whole. And speaking of society, did you know that Switzerland is in third place in the OECD in terms of the share of immigrants in its population, with the foreign-born accounting for 26% of the total population? Germany and Italy are the most common nationalities among foreign citizens living in Switzerland, each accounting for approximately 15% of the total. And thanks to the high demand for skilled labor, Switzerland actually employs more doctors, engineers, and researchers than any developed OECD country. In 2018, the median salary of expats, according to an HSBC survey, was $202,865, more than any other country in the world. And this has very positive consequences for the country's economic development and public finance. And last but not least, Switzerland is so rich in part because they're just really, really smart. Switzerland knows that prosperity in the future will depend on having a highly qualified workforce and an advanced level of technological development. A 2022 centimillionaire report revealed that nine of the 10 most expensive schools worldwide are international schools in Switzerland. But quite frankly, even if you can't afford one of those gilded diplomas from an international school in Switzerland, both public and private education in Switzerland is exceptionally good. In the field of education, Switzerland is the second country in the world with the highest percentage of adults with a PhD. And like all public spending, public education Switzerland is tax funded and decentralized with each of the individual cantons having vast oversight on how to spend their tax dollars on education specifically. In 2021, the Confederation cantons and communes spent 41.3 billion Swiss francs on education. This amount corresponds to 17.7% of the total public expenditure and 5.6% of the gross domestic product. And on a national level, the Swiss economy spends 3% of GDP on research and development. More than 75% of that money comes from the private sector. Not surprisingly then, Swiss companies are the ones with the highest levels of investment in R&D, at 6.6% of their net income. And all of these things together allow Switzerland to maintain its leadership in the pharmaceutical, chemical, engineering, and agricultural industries. So why is Switzerland so rich? Well, quite frankly, it's actually quite complex. A lot of people tend to chum all of this up to its banking and financial sector. But again, the true answer is, well, a lot more in the little details. Historical, economic, and political factors have all contributed to the buildup of Swiss wealth. At times, these factors have been influenced by smart business and smart political decisions. And at other times, well, simply by fate. 
And well, whatever the case it might be, Switzerland is definitely home to the wealthy and the mega rich. But you know, in the meantime, I don't actually qualify to be part of that group. So I'm gonna go back to my car and eat the sandwich that I packed and well, get my rear end back to Germany. But in the meantime, guys, if you enjoyed what you saw today, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. And for more content from Type Ashton, hit that subscribe button. So I'll see you next Sunday. Tschüss.